There you go. There you go. Decided. Hi. Hello. Giving up the garden. Like you turn it into rock. Now. You can do what now? I'm giving up the garden. Oh, turning it into rock. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I said to John, it's like the amount of money I spent last year and the last two years on plants. Oh, I know. And they ate everything. It's just. It's Hey Beth. There's Hello, how are you? Good. Yes, how are you? Good. Good. Ooh, grasshoppers. They ate a Russian sage. Mm -hmm. they, really? yeah. Are these from the Museum or are these CSU? These are, these are um, all from here, actually. These are the ones that I found and put together, collected. They're all from last year. They started to come back in the summer. Well, the conservation stakes are Yeah, they come back. But they ate the Yeah, lots of species to show. They ate the desert willow. I mean, they started coming back in the list. I'm going to check them they all come back. Yeah, they're there. Back. It. It's just that, yeah, they eat all the leaves off of okay. my. Uh, Big, ugly ones. Peony. Mm -hmm. Did that, they eat the leaves on your peony? Have you ever eaten one? I have not. I mean, I don't think I'd ever be inclined to do so. <laughs> they're starting to come up a little bit. Well. Yeah, they are. They're, they're, they're are you yeah. Hi, how are you? Hello. Really if you'll sign in for me, ma'am, and uh, grab a pen and a folder, that would we be great. Right? Them. They have it. Um, you can, have yeah. They're, um, they can be very high in nutrition. Um, so a lot of people do. With their local. We could, local. We could have brought, yeah, I think they were we all in my yard last year. Yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, I had never seen until last year. Mm -hmm. There were some green ones. I have a picture of two mating that I took. They are just, they were so bad. <laughs> Wow. Mostly these people that I think. Yeah. I didn't see any huge ones, thank God. Yeah. Oh, I had a couple of these. Did you? Sure, places. Right. I saved the picture. I saved the picture. Right. I took last year. And then if you just want to grab a picture. Thank you. Okay. You can put stuff in your hair. Of course you will. Of course you will. Our buddy Joe, Olivia, Joe. Are you kidding? No way. Oh, How are your chicks? They're good. Um, Ryan, yes, that was good. Good. Yes. That was that was good. Good. Yeah. Morning. Yes, it's still morning. Yeah, back me. Sorry. Did you take them? How many do you have year round? Um, so I, I, and I bought new different chicks this year. So I am growing my fall to 25. So I have some that will stay at my house, and that's going to go with my parents. Um, so where I'm at, I can live six. So most are going to my parents, but they're very excited. So much work. I've looked into it, and it's probably it is, but it's worth it. So sure, they get a setup. Yeah, and I um, I got heritage specialty eggs. What did they lay like? Pink eggs, blue eggs. I got those. Oh, you and Martha Stewart. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be fancy eggs. So that's nice. But yeah, so I've been. And selling a few it's, that it's I have already, and people are totally shocked because they're like, What do you mean, green eggs? I'm like, Yes, yeah, yeah, right. I love those blue ones. Yeah, so I'm so excited to get those. So yeah, I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm really excited. I got three of the blue layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah,
Next time get him a key, because they just want to oh, yeah. yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. But, uh, and the real snake egg, chicken egg, they will um, all think, yeah. both the brown yeah. snakes and the blue snakes will do that. And the red racers will do that, too. So, yeah. 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 So we they can get in there. They'll eat them. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah, I believe it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hello. Yeah. Good to see yeah. you guys. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. And then just grab a pen and a folder after you sign in. Yeah. And we'll we'll talk about that. <laughs> Fortunately, eradication just is not feasible. <laughs> But I think everybody feels that way, to be fair. So they're kind of like mosquitoes. No one truly wants them around. <laughs> I had mosquitoes on me the other day. I believe it. It's like. And then I'm asking if I need to grab a folder, and then um, we will have a couple of feet rolling around. Hi! You can sign in for me now, and then there's a folder. Um, and if you want to grab a pen, you're welcome to do that. Good bacteria. Yeah, and I know a few of you are not coming to the office. And they both call, so I appreciate it. I mean, that's for travel. I love your face. Thank you. Is it actually your first Yeah, yeah. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. Oh. That's it. I got 15 minutes of all this here for the right now, so we can get it. Okay. Yeah. So you were, you know, uh, making sure people knew about that. Well, so it is one. Um, there's like a couple more people. I'm going to give them just a few more minutes, see if they're parking real quick, if they call my phone, um, and then we'll get started. So appreciate y'all being here, and we'll see. We'll have a very exciting day. <laughs> and don't worry, if you didn't get to see the displays, they're going to be going around when we get to that part. So you will get to see there's quite a few different species. These were all caught locally by myself and the agronomy agent last year. Um, so these are all Pueblo species. So this is what you will be dealing with, unfortunately, this coming year. So. <laughs> And if you're curious what the letters mean on the bottom, it just 
stands for female, and we, like the M was draining with the pen, so it's boy, but it, it's male. So, <laughs> so it's just letting you know what gender it is. So you'll just kind of want to look at that. You'll see the wing size difference. You'll notice the body size difference, things like that. Um, so really take a look at it when you start going around, because there's there's very much you can definitely tell who's who pretty easily. At least on the big ones. So the smaller ones are more difficult. <laughs> So, Robert went to this doctor. He did a lot of investigation on him because he does the middle man business surgery. He went back in uh, early October, and his first replacement surgery appointment was March 12th. Yeah. yeah. So. So while we're waiting, do they do they lose right. color after you after you fill them? They will. Um, they did lose color about like two weeks after we caught them and we froze them, which is how we kept them in pretty good condition. But just because of the tar-like substance that's inside them, sure. it just drains all their color, unfortunately. So if you put them in resin, it does keep the color on um, better. But if they get that and have a case and all those other steps, so. sure, sure, but yeah. Thank you. Well, but yeah, but the really green ones did hold up pretty well. Um, and the black ones stayed nice and black. So, um, so we'll talk about we'll talk about all this. Alrighty. So we'll just go ahead and get started then. And if they join us, they join us. If not, well, that's okay. So I'm going to my clicker's going to work here. It was working earlier. <clears throat> There we go. Okay, so welcome all to the Colorado Grasshopper class. So if you are unfamiliar with extension and you don't know what that is, so we are the arm, the outreach of the university up in Fort Collins. So when we provide classes to the community or anything like that, we just want to make sure you are all aware that we're an equal opportunity provider. We don't discriminate on the basis of disability and we're committed to providing reasonable accommodations. If you want to learn more about CSU's principles of, com of community and our land acknowledgement, which is all based about the university in Fort Collins, you can scan that QR code or you can Google it, especially if you can't sleep at night and you want to read a lot of pages about that, you are welcome <laughs> to do that. Alrighty, so today these are the topics we're going to cover. So my name is Beth Hayes, I'm the Pueblo County Agriculture Natural Resource Coordinator. I've been in this position for about four years now with Extension, um, and I cover all agriculture and natural resources for Pueblo County. So it's a big long-term thing. I do all range management, wildlife, um, I do the bees, I do all livestock and anything like that. So it's a lot of areas to cover and grasshoppers is one of them. <laughs> all righty, so the big question everyone asked, especially last year and of course this year, why in the world were there so many? What happened? <laughs> well, there was a combination of factors. So in Colorado alone, we have over a hundred different species of grasshoppers. So obviously I don't have a hundred up here, um, but I have a good variety. So that's a lot. And then Colorado as a whole goes through a 22 year major outbreak cycle. So that doesn't mean we won't have grasshoppers every year, but just that there are years where there's major, major outbreaks. So we had some in the 1970s, again, in the early uh, 1980s, we should have had one in 2002, but the numbers didn't quite get there. And so now 2024 is the next 22 year major outbreak. So that, I know, yeah, I was like, oh no. <laughs> so unfortunately we're bound to get it this year. Um, so last year, the reason there were so many is we had lots of extra vegetation. We had an extremely mild winter of 2022. So the picture up there in the right hand corner. So um, that was the image there is, is hiding it. But so that was, December of 2023, and that little circle is where Pueblo is, it was considered that we were out of a drought by the Colorado Drought Monitor. It doesn't mean that we didn't have drought-like conditions or that our soil was super wet. It just means it wasn't measurable enough for the county. But then the year before that, again, here we are in that nice little circle, we were almost in extreme drought um, again in December. So we were dry in December. We were a little more wetter last year, but it still wasn't great. And then we had a very mild winter again, right? It's not been cold enough, long enough to do enough damage because they like dry soil, they like a lot of vegetation, and they love our climate. So unfortunately, we make the perfect breeding ground for them. Um, and the other big part is 
when we get warm really fast, like this year, I'm sure you all have noticed that we have got really warm very quickly, considering for our area, they're going to hatch earlier. That's the problem mm -hmm. because it's perfect soil temperatures for them. So the earlier we have a warm spring and the longer it sticks around, the more grass up first we have. So that's the other big forecast feature of what happens. Now, the other big thing is that bird. So these really big ones that you all saw probably a lot last year, these are called plains lover or homesteader grasshoppers. They're only eaten by one species of bird in the entire state. Oh, no, no, no. head strike. And there's not that many in our area, unfortunately. So that's why these guys were so everywhere because most of the predators won't eat them because that tar like substance, when you asked about the color question, these guys have so much tar in it and they spit it out as a defense mechanism against big predators. Except for this bird, all the other birds, their beaks get closed shut by this tar like substance. So they stay away from them. They won't eat them. They might pull off a leg or something like that, but they're not really going to do enough damage where it can't move around and, and still be a grasshopper. So um, these guys are, are a problem. Can we get more birds? <laughs> we'll talk about that because, yeah, <laughs> birds are definitely a huge part of managing grasshoppers. So looking into spring 2024, We've had heavy egg laying in 2023, right? Because unfortunately, all the ones we saw last year, they did exactly what they were supposed to. They live annually, so all those adults mated. They laid a bunch of eggs, and we're going to talk about how many eggs. And then they overwintered because we had a very light winter. So two a week ago, I was in Fremont County teaching a class, and they were already letting me know that everyone there had already seen grasshoppers. Um, so they have already emerged. Even though we got that snow that is now melting, it wasn't cold enough. As you all saw, that was melting within the day it was yeah. it landed, right? That soil temperature didn't hit freezing. And neither was the snow was heavy and wet, but it just kind of it was more like rain. It really yeah. didn't stick around. That's not enough to do anything to them. <laughs> they will find a place to hide under dead leaves that everyone has in their yard, your dead grass. Those are perfect hiding spots for grasshoppers this time of year. They're just gonna wait it out. It doesn't affect them. So just because there's snow on the ground this time of year doesn't mean it worked for the grasshoppers. <laughs> so that's a problem. Um, and the other problem is, is we're going to switch this year from El Nino to La Nina. And unfortunately, the way that pattern is going to happen, it's going to be too late with their life cycle to affect this year's threshold numbers of grasshoppers. So El Nino is where we're dry than normal above us a little bit and wetter than normal below us. And it doesn't mean we're not either going to be a little drier, a little wetter than normal. It just means we have equal chances of getting both, which unfortunately, that's perfect for grasshoppers because they're like dry soil, wet vegetation. Love it. And you're like, cool, really bad for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not great. So what's going to happen if you guys look at the chart there and let's see if my little animation yeah. will place. So you can see we're, we're starting out in El Nino. Then we're switching to like neutral from April, May. La Nina starts in June to August and it goes through the rest of the year. So grasshoppers generally start hatching in that March to May time frame. That is when we're still stuck in this dry and wet stage. Right? So by the time that we switch to La Nina, and I'll show you what that looks like, in that May, July time, we're already looking at adult grasshoppers. It's not going to affect them in that change of weather pattern, unfortunately. So that's the big part of when we talk about these big global impacts on climate, what does that mean for us on a local level? I mean, we're providing perfect conditions for them to continue to multiply, unfortunately. So we're kind of creating a perfect storm. So this year, these are from the NOAA weather station. So this is overall for the entire United States. But so looking from April to May to June, as you can see here, it's saying that we're probably we're going to be warmer than average, unfortunately, for the next couple months, which is great for plants and a lot of other things, but for the grasshoppers, it's also great. <laughs> so that's kind of the deal we're looking at. As far as precipitation goes for the same time frame, it's saying we have equal chances. So it might be where we get a little bit more rain possibly in our springtime season, but nothing a lot, not like what we saw last year where there was just huge amounts of water that we weren't used to in this area. So that's kind of what we're looking at from that perspective. So when we talk about that switch, so this is El Nino, this is La Nina. So you can see it kind of switches a little bit, but the difference is, is that instead of being dry on top, it gets cooler than normal above us and drier than normal directly below us and warm as well. So then we kind of get that collision factor. But that cold isn't really going to affect us because if you remember, Pueblo is down here. So this cold really isn't going to come down to us until the fall like it should normally. And it'll affect our winter season for this year. But unfortunately, it's just not going to affect us 
during the growing season and when the grasshoppers are going to have the biggest impact. So, so if you hear reports on the news and they're like, La Nina is going to bring a lot of good things, it will, but not in terms of grasshoppers, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so these are maps from the USDA um, study that was done last year on grasshoppers uh, statewide. So the one on the left is that nymph stage, which we'll talk about. That's the immature stage. They don't have fully formed wings. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do from a management perspective. That's the best time to get them and knock them down when they're in this stage. This other map is the adult stage. The red and yellow are the worst colors. Red is 15 plus in a square foot area. Yellow is eight to 14. This is Pueblo <laughs> for all the nymphs, okay? That's Pueblo for all the adults. <laughs> that was from last year alone. Okay? Um, and they didn't sex any of them. So um, you can bet that most of those were females who laid eggs and are continuing the population threshold. So looking at this number alone, it's guaranteed we're gonna have another major outbreak. It's just, it's the perfect storm. So last year, this was the numbers um, nationwide from the grasshopper perspective. As you can see, um, again, Colorado, where that red spot is, that's Pueblo. <laughs> so that is 15 plus, um, that is done in a square yard um, that covers 44.5 million acres. And of course, we're right in the center <laughs> of that. So we have one of the highest concentrations um, for our part of the state outside of the north corners, really. So we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of grasshoppers. This year, it's just it's just the way it is, unfortunately. Not as bad as Montana. I mean, their whole state is basically oh, yeah. grasshopper built, so it could be worse if you really want to feel about that. So let's talk about what exactly is a grasshopper. We're going to talk about their life cycle. We're going to talk about species. How do you know what level of grasshopper they're dealing with? And then we'll get into some management. So grasshoppers are related to katydids and crickets. So that picture up there on the top. The top one, that is a kitty did. We do have some of those here. The next one is a cricket. And then the bottom one is our grasshopper. So crickets and grasshoppers look very similar, but they are different species. So grasshoppers themselves, everyone asks, what in the world do they do? Well, they do serve as decomposers. They do aid in plant growth, and they are a food source for a lot of different wildlife species. A lot of people do ask, are there enough species to impact grasshoppers? Unfortunately, not because they eat other things, right? Birds, and we're going to talk about praying mantis and dragonflies and wasps. All of those eat grasshoppers, but they eat a lot of other things too. So when you think about that, and you saw the maps of how heavy their population is, there's not enough specific predators just for grasshoppers that are going to affect their, their thread count. So that's kind of where that comes from. So as far as the description goes, I mean, you all have seen the grasshoppers while you're here, right? <laughs> but if you haven't, <laughs> um, they have chewing mouth parts, they have two pairs of wings, they have long hind limbs for jumping, and then they have very short antenna. So a lot of people get confused. When we pass these around, um, this guy is called a Mormon cricket, but he actually is still classified as a grasshopper. So even though the name was Mormon cricket, um, he is a grasshopper. But you'll kind of be able to see the difference between this and these big plain blubber ones that you'll see that he has a tail, which is like it's for depositing eggs. It's not a weapon. A lot of folks were like, it's for stabbing. It's not. It's just <laughs> it's just for egg deposit. Um, but you'll see that if you have a cricket, they have very long antenna. Their legs are what they rub together to make noise is how crickets do. Grasshoppers can make noise, but they have to rub their legs against their wings. So that's the other big difference. So if you see something, you're like, I don't know if it's a cricket or a grasshopper. Those are the kind of two big takeaways is how big are their antennas and then if you see them making noise are they doing it with their wings or their legs that's, that's the big thing and often crickets can't fly there are some species that can we don't have a lot of those so if you like get near it and it actually has wings and it flies away that tells you it was most likely a grasshopper instead of a cricket um in grasshoppers the females are larger than the males and when we pass these around you'll be able to see that so this is a male on this one, and this is a female. You'll notice that the females have very small wings. When I pass this around, the males have very big, larger wings. And that's because the males have to be the ones searching for the females. They don't really have to do a whole lot. They can just stay in one spot and eat and do everything, and everything comes to them, basically. So that's kind of why that difference happens. So that's kind of how you can tell. It's harder on some of these other smaller species, unless you can definitely find a couple, um, but it's kind of the same across all species of grasshoppers, that the females are generally larger, it goes down to wing size, and just overall body size is kind of how you determine who's who. They're most active during the day, but they do feed at night. Um, they're not, they don't have nests or territories or anything like that, so unfortunately they won't like 
fight each other over a certain amount of space. They just they just all hang out. Um, and they're solo is the big thing. And we're going to talk about locusts because everyone has questions about that. So with grasshoppers, normally, they will just hang out by themselves. They don't seek each other out unless they're mating. So just keep that in mind when we get to that part. And then these are our known predators, and we're going to talk about them in more detail. So just showing you the list, um, and, but we'll talk about them. All right. So from a life cycle. So overall in the world, there's over 11,000 species. And like I said, there's over 100 that live here in Colorado. So grasshoppers in general, they lay their eggs in late summer, early fall. That's what their eggs look like. And then they hatch about that March, April timeframe generally, late March, early April. Some species do hatch as late as May, but there's only like one or two that do that. And they kind of space that out so they're not all competing for the same food source at the same time. The other nice thing is because they do that, sometimes other bird species that are hatching their young at different times will actually prey more on certain specific species of grasshopper because of the time they hatch. So it actually kind of works out a little nice. So the nymph is that immature stage, right? So we have our eggs, they hatch, they have to go through five molts, that five immature stage, and then they're adult. The problem is when they hit that adult stage, their exoskeleton hardens, and you guys are welcome to touch these and I'll start passing them around. It's like armor. So if you're using a spray, you are burning your money. <laughs> it's not going to penetrate their exoskeleton. Don't do that. If you have adults and they get to adults in five to six weeks from the minute they get out of those eggs, your window of time to impact these guys is small. So if you have adults, the biggest way to tell if you have an adult, if it has fully formed wings and it can take off and fly, that's an adult. All of the nymphs, regardless of what stage you're in, they have wings, but they can't actually fly. So if you see one and you take a step and it kind of jumps and it like flaps its wings, but it actually doesn't go too far, that's a nymph, which means you can do sprays, you can do different things and it will affect them. But if you only have something that has lots of wings and most of them can fly, don't use a spray. You're just, just go and burn your money in your fire pit. You're better off. <laughs> it's just, it's not worth it. So that's the only really big thing. And then of course, once they reach that adult stage, they're the ones that lay the eggs, um, immature ones can't. So if you can knock down that threshold early, at the right time, at the light, right life stage, you can severely start cutting down how much are in your area because that's less eggs every year, right? So regardless of what's happening on a huge global climate or even our state climate, if you can knock down the adults less eggs, you're gonna have less grasshoppers, right? So it's a multi-year project, unfortunately, because you're just you're not gonna get all these guys in one year. There's just there's too many of them. I'm gonna start passing some of these around and we'll start talking. Can I ask questions later? Um, if you have one on the slide, you're welcome, but we'll kind of try to keep it moving. So, you have something about this slide? It was just a question of as soon as they become adults, are they automatically laying as soon as they become adults? No, they won't. Um, almost all of our species, except like two of them, they won't lay eggs until like August, October, around that time. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Are, are there certain places that you can look for eggs to? There are, yeah, and we'll talk about okay. it. But the biggest places to look under, like, where there's a lot of like leaf piles and dead um, dead logs and like really tall grass, they like to hide their eggs. So um, where you have, a, of course, a lot of leaf debris and matter, that's where their eggs are gonna be. <laughs> All right, so life stage and species ID and why is this important? So kind of what I've been talking about, right? If you know what life stage you're dealing with, you know the best way to treat them and deal with them. Species is also really important because not every species eats the same thing. There are certain species that only eat grasses, so they won't eat your tomato plants. They're going to not eat your eggplants. They're not going to do that because their mouth parts aren't designed to eat that type of plant. So knowing what type of species you have, knowing their life cycle can tell you, do I actually need to treat? Do I actually need to do something or do I not? Right? So it's, that's why those two things are really, really important. Otherwise, you're just out there burning money. Nobody wants, nobody can afford to do that in this economy. So um, don't do that. So again, remember that the way you tell where you're at life stage is wing pad and body length, right? And the biggest takeaway, if you can't, if you don't feel comfortable reaching out and like taking one of those and kind of looking at it, I would see if it has wings or not. Can it actually fly or not? That will tell you I'm either dealing with an adult or I'm dealing with a nymph. It doesn't matter if you're in stage four or stage five, it's not that much of a difference as far as management goes. As long as they don't have fully mature wings, it's a nymph. That's, all, that's the biggest part. So 
once you know that for life stage, there's three subfamilies that we're going to worry about. And they're really easy to identify. And I'll, I have pictures on the next slide. So the first one is the slant faced. So they're brown or, or green or gray, sorry, as nymphs, and they have clear wings. That's a really key part. They, their heads are kind of weirdly disproportionate, and they have very slanted faces when you look at them from like straight on. And you'll see that in the picture. Spur-throated, they're green as nips, um, and they have a spur or a spine that's on their throat, which is right between their front legs. Unfortunately, you would have to flip them over to see that, um, but it, it, you'll see kind of what they look like, and it's pretty obvious. And then bang-winged, um, they have bright red or yellow right by their wings um, as adults, and they are a little different where you see the adults a little early on and the nymphs later because their cycle is a little reversed. So that's kind of how you would know that you have something like that. So picture-wise, let me, I'm going to minimize his picture so you guys can kind of see this. Oh, where did my mouse go? There we go. All right. So, um, so like I said, this is our slant faced. So remember, his face is very slanted. If you look at it, his head, in comparison, it's kind of like oddly shaped. So if you looked at that and their faces is very slanted, you know it's slant faced, right? The spur-throated, that's our guy up there in that corner. And this right here, this bowl ball right there, that is the spur. That's that's the spur. So if you ever did want to know for sure and you're comfortable kind of getting down and really looking at these guys, um, you can flip it over. And if you see that little bump right there in between their front legs, that, that would be a spur. Spur-throated guy. And then the bang-winged, you can see this. He has some nice, get some color right there by his wings. Um, and it's and it's yellow. So don't worry so much about the red on that one because that's a little higher up. We want that yellow right there on that leg appendage is what we're looking at. So, and then if you remember the slant face, they have clear wings. So his wings are completely clear. There's no color in that one. So um, common Colorado species, there's these guys. And of course, this is not an extensive list. This is not all 100 um, or more, but these are the main ones that we see a lot in our area. So like the differential grasshopper, they really call that one slant face because his face is kind of more um, slanted down. Clear wing, it tells you what type that one is. Um, we have the red wing, we have a bunch of those. And a lot of those are on those different um, deals that I passed around. And what's nice is in your folder, you all have it's the one that's on the left hand side it's the grasshopper control and gardens and small acreage it actually runs you through all these different types which is really nice and it tells you what they eat so like the and on the next slide it tells you so like that differential grasshopper they like gardens that's a big problem migratory grasshoppers which i don't have a picture of on the side but you have a picture of in your handout they're really damaging to croplands um, and they hatch early. They do long flights. The two strike, they're another big damager to gardens and things like that. They really like empty lots, roadsides, other undisturbed sites because that's where they like to hide their eggs. That's where they like to breed. Um, they hatch in late spring. So they're a few weeks later than a lot of the other grasshopper species. So things like that are very helpful to know. And that way, when you're out in the field, let me go back a slide. And you're seeing all these different guys and you're like, I don't really know what I'm looking at. I want to make sure I'm going to get my money's worth for whatever I'm doing. You know what you're dealing with. Take a little bit of time, ID it. Even if you just take a picture of it, you get really close. I mean, these are done by cameras. You can get your phones work really, really well. Get a nice picture of it. Take the time, try to ID it. And that way you know what is the best management tool I need to deal with what I have. All right. so. Now we're talking about threshold numbers, because that is the other big problem. So these are their eggs. So depending on the species, but they all kind of do the same thing. They're either going to stick them to the under parts of leaves if they can, they're going to put them into an inch or less of soil, or they're going to hide them. So under piles of dead leaves, they like things if you have like a lot of dead logs somewhere in your property. If you have like a ton of mulch that's been there for five plus years and it's deep and it's thick and it's just real, you know, encased, love it. They love that stuff. That's a problem. So what do we do about that? Well, we're going to talk about that because unfortunately, like I said, you're never going to get rid of them. It's just, it's not. The only way you're really going to affect them is if you took a blow torch and you just torched me and you're tired. You just you literally did a scorch earth policy. Um, you will get them all, but you're going to get everything else. So that is, that is the deal. So that's why we say 
management yeah. doesn't equal eradication. Management is figuring out what is an acceptable threshold that you're willing to deal with um, and what does that mean to you and your goals? It's very different if you have a garden or you're dealing with rangeland or you have a larger space. It kind of depends on what are you growing? What are you trying to protect? And then how many can you realistically deal with as far as a damage assessment? So that's what it's called in large crop areas is it an, an economic threshold where the damage they're doing is worth more than the money it's going to cost to fix it. Because usually if it's a large enough area, they do um, aerial sprays with airplanes because there's too many. They can't do it on the ground. There, there's nothing they can do. So that's where for them that cost really comes into hand. For most of you guys, um, you know, you'd be out there spot spraying or doing baits or doing different things. It wouldn't be that much money. But as you all know, if you're trying to decide how much am I going to spend in my garden, how much am I going to put for a new gutter system, all those things that go into being outdoors, you're going to have to pick and choose a project. I mean, I'm not rich. Is anyone in here a billionaire? No? Okay. So none of you all probably have the money to do every project you want to do this year, unfortunately. So with this, you also have to pick and choose how much money do you want to spend on it. So when we talk about threshold, the USDA says if you have 15 to 20 nymphs, which is our immature stage, or 18 to 8 to 10 adults per square yard, then you're at that threshold of damage, that you're going to have enough damage where you're going to have an economic impact, whether even in a garden. That's where you're kind of looking for a number. So there's two ways to do this. There's a visual count, and we'll walk through that, and a sweep net. You can buy these nets online, but it's really easy to do a visual count, and I'm going to walk you guys through how to do that. And in your handouts, you actually have a sheet that gives you a score sheet on how to do that, and you can just reprint these, or you can ask me for it, and I can email it to you as many times as you want to do a count. So it's really easy. And then, of course, when we think about threshold, you guys saw the maps. You saw the hazard danger. We talked about their life cycle. Now let's talk about laying their eggs. So each female lays around 25 egg pods. In an egg pod, there's four to 40 eggs in a pod. So that's 100 to 200 eggs on average for a female, but it's not unrealistic that they lay up to 500 eggs one female, okay? So real quick, let's go back and let's look at those maps. And I just, in your brain, just think about that. So this is our immature stage. That's our adult numbers. So remember, every little color, regardless of the color, had a, we'll just say 50% of those was female that they counted, right? But if we go 150 in all those dots, that's a lot of eggs, right? So we know that it's, it's just going to be a high number year. It just, it is. It's, it's a management year. There's just, it's, that's just the way it is, unfortunately, when you look at the map. All right, so. So Beth, you said it's a 22-year cycle. Mm -hmm. How long does this last? Can I wait it out? <laughs> um, unfortunately not. I mean, if you wait it out, the problem is, is they're just going to keep reproducing. They're going to keep laying eggs. And your air, like your neighbor's area may be really well managed, and she may really knock down her threshold. But if you do nothing, your numbers are so, just going to keep going up and up and up. So that's oh, really, yeah, that it, is the problem. It, won't, it wouldn't drop off naturally. The only thing is if once they run out of food at, at your place, they're going <laughs> to migrate to your neighbors <laughs> and she's going to have to start her process all over again. So all you're going to do is you can starve them out. But I mean, it's going to take a couple of life cycles for that to happen before you really, really yeah, see that life cycles. Yeah, I mean, it, you'd be looking at like between five and six life cycles. So that's five to six years with adults. Right, yeah. So, I mean, if you want to wait that long, you can. I any a few years ago. It, and sometimes and sometimes if we have a harder winter, if we get really oh, cold. So depending on the weather. Yeah. So it could drop off. Too, it weather. could drop off from weather. Um, okay. But because unfortunately none of us can affect that. Um, right. We've And we've been in a drought for so long. It's We're, oh, we're okay. trying to get back on that cycle of wetness. Okay. And unfortunately, our state is... We're better this year overall in wet in uh, water, but we're not we're not at that point where we're going to catch up from an insect perspective. Okay. So, yeah, and unfortunately, this isn't just grasshoppers. There's a lot of other insects that have boomed in population simply because of climate conditions that favor them, and we just haven't caught up to where we can knock them back down. So, okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So. All right, so before we fully get into counting grasshoppers, I really briefly wanted to talk about locust levels because it kind of impacts that. Because when people think about grasshopper levels, I cannot tell you the number of calls I got last year and they're like, it's locust swarms. I'm like, it's not. <laughs> um, but it seems like it because there's so many. Like when we went and caught, um, who has the one with the really big ones? 
So um, when we caught these guys, we went over by, um, if you guys know where, if you go up till towards Gila, that area, this is where we caught these guys. There were so many that we could, we had to shuffle our feet because there was so many. Oh, okay. you, you couldn't take a step because they were crawling all over your shoes, your oh. pants. They were just, I mean, the ground was, was grasshoppers. There wasn't dirt, so it was just these guys. So there's a lot, but that doesn't mean they're locusts. So all locusts are grasshoppers, but not all grasshoppers are locusts. So they're the same species. They are a grasshopper, but it's a change. It's a DNA mutation that happens when they're in adult form that changes their size, their color, their behavior, and their eating habits. It's a complete change. So in this picture, it's the exact same species. The brown one is a grasshopper. The one on the right is a locust. Look at that change. It's massive. It's astounding that they can do this. As an adult, wow. they're completely changing their internal sense of self in a matter of hours. That's how fast this happens. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's outstanding. So what it, this is called is it's a gregarious behavior. So what happens, and there's a lot of factors that affect it, like geographic area, weather, species, things like that. But what happens is if all those come together, it's a perfect storm. And so remember, we talked about normally grasshoppers, they don't really get together outside of mating. They, they kind of just do their own thing. They don't care about the others. But the problem is, is if they're all crowded together, they start touching each other a lot. It creates a rise of serotonin. That rise of serotonin in that group setting then causes the mutation to start. And it happens in a matter of hours. So what that happens is they change color. They get larger muscles. You can't really see it in that picture, but they get larger muscles on their back legs on these. So you guys all saw how massive their legs are. They, they get bigger. And they their, their wings, the yeah, they hook <laughs> out basically. It's like the Hulk and Bruce Banner kind of thing. Um, wow. And because they're they're making it where they can fly longer. So they get bigger back legs, their wings get longer so they can fly longer and they can swarm, so they can stay together. Um, and then they get the color change and they get very aggressive. So um, it's just, it's crazy. So um, there is a thing that's called the Locust Watch. It's done by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations because this happens across the world and it's devastating. Everyone's afraid of locusts because it will literally destroy a civilization if it's not somehow stopped. <laughs> and they will eat us out. Um, right now, there's only 20 known locust species among the potential that could have this mutation in the 7,000. So not all 11,000 worldwide species can do this. Only about the 7,000 that they have tested, 20 of those can turn into locusts that they know as of right now. So they're still doing a lot of testing, but that's kind of where that's at. So this is the map of the 1875 locust in invasion. Um, that's Texas to Montana. So it was massive. Um, the problem, so the nice thing is, um, is right now in the United States, we don't have any grasshopper species that have a locust gene. The problem is they are in Mexico. It's the Central American locust and Texas A&M is prepping, they're doing studies, they have a locust lab because they're well aware that because of this, it's only a matter of time before they cross the border because insects don't give a crap about yeah, borders. Just <laughs> <laughs> they're just gonna come right on over. Um, so, and because we're creating really good climate conditions for them on a worldwide look, um, it's looking like it, this is going to happen the next year or so. It's, it's what they're expecting. They're watching it very hard, um, but it's likely that it's just, it's, it's going to happen um, and we just need to be prepped. So during the 1800s when this happened, the swarms were so big that it, you all know how big Texas is, right? This swarm, that path it took up that middle stretch of Texas, it blocked out the sun on Texas. The reports say from back then. So that, you can, I don't even know if you guys can imagine. It. Like, you could be anywhere in Texas and it's dark because there's so many bugs. Like, that's a lot. Wow. Has there been a swarm like that since? There was one here in 1937, and I have photos. Um, but oh after gosh. that, um, there hasn't been another swarm, thankfully. So this is, this picture's in Colorado Springs. This is not vegetation. These are locusts. Wow. So those are bugs. Yeah, that's, um, those are, those are all bugs. Um, Doing this, everyone was terrified to come in my office when I was making this for you all because they're like, ew. And I'm like, oh, yeah, imagine living back then. <laughs> Terrifying. Um, this other picture is also from Colorado. This is in 1937 when the last big swarm happened. They called out the National Guard, and because there were so many, um, they were using flamethrowers and grenades. 
because oh, that wow. was it. Um, they were oh, so big geez. and aggressive that that was that was the option. Um, they have done. There's pictures where you can see them in the field with horses and their flamethrowers, and they're just dragging them through the fields, just trying to blow them up. Basically, they did a scorch earth policy because there was nothing else you could do. Like everything was dead by that point. So there was just so many. The reason, and there's a really good documentary um, I encourage you guys to watch. It's called What Happened to the North. Um, it's called The Rocky Mountain Locust. Did the farmer kill the Rocky Mountain locust? It's really good. They do, they do a great job in depth about it. Um, but basically, they're not exactly sure why they died out, but they think it was a numbers game. Where basically, there were so many that they ran out of food. Mm -hmm. And then we really upped our game in agriculture. We started disturbing the soil. We, had, we brought in animals to kind of trample up the dirt and stuff that disturbed their egg cycle. And they were forced out of their main mating areas in the Rocky Mountain region into other areas where they didn't really like to mate. And so we just knocked out their threshold. Basically, they exterminated themselves, so the locust species did, because they ate all the food. Then they went to a spot where they really couldn't mate. They didn't really lay eggs. And then we came along and disturbed everything, and they never really occurred. So that's how we did it. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mean that they're not going to So there's back. a prediction that in the next couple of years, locusts are coming up from Mexico, kind mm -hmm. of up that same path. Yep. Eastern, the Eastern Plains, mm -hmm. the Eastern Plains, yeah. Mexico. Yeah, it's they're they're pretty much predicting that they're going to follow this historic range um, because and probably even go a little farther east because of the way that we've changed agriculture in the United States since 1875. So um, and probably they'll highly very likely go to California because yeah. that is one of the biggest ag squashers sure. in the United States. So it will be a, a and that was like kind of huge during the dust bowl. Yeah, and which, which they like dust and dry. So that's yeah. also why we're like leave a cover crop on like I know nobody likes weeds but in this sense having something on your soil is better than right. nothing so to try and, and think about this on a huge huge scale so yeah so that's so because a lot of people were concerned about that so there is a locust watch you're welcome to watch it online they show you the maps of where the infestations are now across the world what they're doing how it's going um it's pretty interesting there's a really big part in Yemen um if you know like in that Egypt mm -hmm. area they're all in some of the most fertile grounds <laughs> in the world, unfortunately. But they have really knocked it down. Um, they take this very seriously, which is important for human survival. Um, and they're just they're fighting it as best they can. So it's but it's something to keep an eye on. So when you're out there, now that I've scared you with the idea of locusts, <laughs> yeah, what's the locust look like? <laughs> don't worry, we don't have any. Or did or I test you? Be like, can you identify which one is a locust? Because call me <laughs> immediately. Um, you want to do a threshold measure. So in your handout, that looks like it's on the right hand side. It is the, it's the second one. It's the Grasshopper Biology Modern Monitoring. This is the one that we're going to walk through so you guys know how to do that threshold. Okay. So the basic rules of it, stop, look, count, collect. That's it. That, that's it. There's a little bit more math to it, but that's that's the gist of it. So the big part is you got to do it right time of year and temperature. So you want to count adults um, is the big thing. You can do it with nymphs, but it's going to be harder because you're going to they could get stuck if it's like taller grass or something because it can't fly yet. So you're going to have to pay more attention. So you can do it with nymphs. Just be aware that they're not going to be able to fly. So you're going to have to really probably get lower and really look at the area that you're scoping out and do your count that way and make sure you're aware it's nymph stage not adult stage okay so with temperature you want to be between 60 and 95 degrees so around this time of year that's not too hard that's like our you know nice warm day you could get out and start counting you want the the wind less uh, than 15 miles per hour and the vegetation can't be soaking wet if there's a little bit of dew or it's a little damp that's fine but if it's drenched like right after a rain pour there's there's no point they're going to just be hanging out waiting for their wings to kind of dry and stuff they're not they're not going to come out so your count's not going to be accurate okay so the way you do this is you make a grid. So for example, this is this is a very large area, but if you wanted to do like a patch around your garden and you kind of wanted to know how many grasshoppers do I have in this area that I have to actually deal with, you want to get out, you're gonna stop and you're gonna imagine a square foot yard in front of you, okay? So in that square foot yard visually, you're going to just take three or four steps towards that and you're gonna watch and count how many jump out of that not into it don't count the ones that jump in you want to count the ones that jump out okay so and then as you get closer keep counting and then once you're in this is my little square foot yard i'm looking at i'm going to disturb this whole area 
and continue to count to see how many I disturb. Okay. So then on this sheet, page three. This is your score sheet. So your once. So if that, if that was my first square foot, I'm going to put. If I saw more than two jump out after I did that whole thing, it gets a score of one. If it's one or less, it's a score of zero. Okay. And you're just going to keep going for however big your area is, and you're going to total them up, um, and then you figure out your threshold number. So it walks you through the whole thing. So page one and two are your full steps, and how do you completely do the math to do your threshold numbers, um, whether they're in that nymph stage or the adult stage, because remember, those are different numbers. Um, and it also asks you what the habitat is, because if you change habitat, so if you have a larger area, like if you have a couple acres or two, out towards Pueblo West or something like that. Maybe your garden is that first little bit, and then after that, it's real rocky. Maybe you have some pinion trees, you have some some of the sagebrush, you have some other things. You're going to deal with different grasses, uh, different species of grasshoppers, right? So you might want to note that too on your little sheet and be like, all right, well, this first square foot was right by my garden. I saw a lot of clear winged grasshoppers, but the minute that I stepped farther out and I'm over by the pinions, now I'm seeing plain clever graph hoppers and I'm counting those. Okay. Don't don't count all of those together because that's going to mess up your threshold for the different species and how much bait or whatever you're going to do or how much money you're going to spend. Okay. So definitely use this one. If you um, if you do it and you need another sheet of, of of this and you can't find it, let me know. I can always email this to you. It is publicly online on um so you can always just Google this name and it'll pop up. Um, but if you don't want to take the time to search through all of it, because it's a university publication, which means we like to hide it, um, <laughs> we just need to get it to you. So, so that one is very, very handy. Um, the other nice thing is it talks about how to collect them. So the other way is if you want to do it with a net. So if you have 50 acres or you have more than that, and you're like, I'm not going to stop every mile and get out and count, get out and count. And it's easier if you could just do like a sweeping net. They have two um, links here that you can call and get a net from and purchase them. And it's kind of the same thing. So you just use this net. It's like if you guys something like a butterfly net, it's something like that, where you just hold it up on a stick and you just do a sweep and then you can collect it, count, and then be able to identify what species you're looking at. It's the same process, it's just using a net instead of just visually using your eyes. Um, and then it gives you the nice how old are they shows you how to use, like count their wing scales, all that good stuff. Um, so this one is, is a really, really helpful one as well that I encourage you to look over. So, very good content. All right, so everyone's big question. Management, how do we do this? So with management, we think of IPM, which stands for Integrated Pest Management. And it's a variety of ways that you can handle really any insect problem that you're dealing with. It, it's not just grasshoppers. If you have a beetle infestation in some of your trees, or you're dealing with mites, or you're dealing with whatever the case is, this same idea of IPM can be applied to all of those, which is really nice. So the first thing you need to think about is what are your goals, right? If it's just a garden, that's a pretty easy defensible space, and you can make it safe around that space. And if the rest of your yard is just grass and maybe some trees and things like that, but it's nothing too huge that you're really like, trying to defend, I would almost say how much like if you're if they eat a little bit of your grass, is it really that big of a deal because you're going to mow it anyway, right? Like it's it, no one wants grasshoppers, but if you had to pick between your garden space yes. and your grass, <laughs> you're probably going to say, well, you can have the grass. I want my garden, right? So think about that. If you are on a range setting and you're running cows or you're doing some other livestock operation and you have a large enough threshold, they can eat 30, 30 to 40 percent of the range land out of the cows are gonna eat. That's huge when we think about raising animals, right? Even if you have goats and sheep and maybe you're on like five acres and you're trying to do rotation pasture management, things like that, if you have enough grasshoppers, you can forget having any feed for them on the ground because grasshoppers are gonna eat it all. So um, just, just goals to think about, like what are you actually trying to do? So for management, we can always do birds and poultry, which we talked about. Um, we can always do bird houses, bird feeders, encourage them because all of our species here, like the little small guys, like our finches, our sparrows, blue jays, gackles, all of them will eat grasshoppers. So the more bird species you have, the more mm -hmm. chances you are of them eating the, the grasshoppers. I had one lady call me and she said she had zero grasshoppers 
because she had like 15 bird feeders and she had this colony of um, sparrows that lived in her trees. And I was seeing grasshopper. The house right next to her was devastated. There was no plant life. <laughs> but they didn't dare cross that property line because of the birds. And birds will defend their territory. So um, it's, it's, it's a big thing to think about. Of course, if you have things like poultry or things like that, you definitely use them. Poultry of all shapes and sizes love um, grasshoppers. It's a treat for them. I have chickens myself. I can tell you, I really didn't have too many grasshoppers because my birds took care of that for me. So definitely use them as an advantage. Um, you can do beneficial insects, and we're going to talk about that. So that things like robber flies, wasps will eat them, um, blister beetles, praying mantis, dragonflies, centipedes, a lot of those will eat grasshoppers, and you can encourage them in your yard to kind of help with that beneficial um, level of eating them. So something to think about. And then, of course, we have insects and bait. But the problem with most of those is, unfortunately, they never affect just grasshoppers. They will always affect other insects. You can harm beneficial insects. You can harm pollinators. So that's something to consider. If you're going to go that route, make sure you read the label. <laughs> because if you don't, and you're just out there with a t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops, and you're out there just spraying the high heaven, well, <laughs> um, that can be very bad for you. It can be bad for your neighbor. It can be bad for your dog. It can cause a lot of issues. So make sure you read the label, and we'll go over that. And the last part is if you are going to use this, make sure you have the proper PPE, which stands for personal protection equipment, which means gloves. That means like if, you know, if it's a skin irritant, you shouldn't be out there in shorts or like a Speedo, right? <laughs> you should have long pants on um, and that you should have closed toed shoes most of the time. So just knowing what is on that label is huge and making sure you're going to protect yourself if you're going to use those. So if we think about that from a IPM standpoint, that's what this nice little triangle is here. If you'll notice, chemical, chemical control is the smallest bit on the very top. It's not something that's often recommended because of the effects it has on the overall ecosystem. Because unfortunately, you, you, it's a scorched earth policy. You're going to kill other things. It's just the way it is. But sometimes if your threshold numbers are so high, that is what you have to do, unfortunately. Because the other insects, they will bound back. They will come back, you know, after maybe a year or so on their life cycle or the species you affect. But they will come back. It's just being aware of that. And then we go down to biological control, which is like our beneficial insects, right? And we have... Um, Mechanical, physical, and natural control. So we're going to talk about that, which you can do things like disturbing the ground, making sure your leaf litter is kind of moved in different areas, um, increasing ground temperature in the winter time, just different things you can do to kind of keep that from happening without having to do like a bunch of chemicals or things like that. And then we look at detection, which is our monitoring, which we just went through with our threshold counts, right? Your visual counts, your sweep net, and then just prevention, which is just, you know, what are you doing on a year to year basis? You're knowing that in March, April, I need to get on this, right? I need to start disturbing those egg counts. I need to be watching of who's approaching, who's popping out of eggs early, um, and what species am I dealing with this year, right? So just because you got rid of maybe one species in, in your little garden area and you're super excited, and then your neighbor goes, yeah, but I didn't do anything about these big guys. I'm gonna sweep them all your way. <laughs> oh no, right? So just be aware of what's happening um, in your area and just looking ahead. Don't don't react, be proactive with these guys. That's, that's the best way to do it. So now we're gonna go into reading the label. So this is, this is just a generic label. This isn't anything in particular, but there's a few really key things that you wanna read on here. So there's signal words, and I know it's just kind of small, but there's signal words. It's how toxic is the product. So green is just caution, so that's mildly toxic. Yellow is a warning, it's moderately toxic. Red is danger, it's highly toxic. That means it's either very toxic to you or other animals like dogs, cats, birds, whatever. And you need to be very, very careful with this one, okay? The other big thing is an active ingredient. So don't go for just the brand name that you can buy from Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever you're buying this, because a lot of people are like, oh, well, I use seven or I use whatever. But if I ask you what is the active ingredient and you don't know, that's gonna tell me you actually don't know, one, how it's killing them, to what else it's affecting because the active ingredient is going to tell you if it's going to affect the bees that are coming into your yard if it's going to affect the praying mantis you just spent 150 dollars on and you brought all those eggs and then you use that and you just kill them all right mm. so knowing the active ingredient is more important than knowing the brand name that's way more important okay um directions for use that one's a pretty easy one but use as intended right if it says don't put out right after a rainstorm 
please do that. <laughs> Follow its instructions, they're there for a reason. Um, storage and disposal, this is a big one. Some chemicals cannot be stored in a garage that gets below 32 at night. Um, they can explode, they can do different things, they can burst through their bottles, they can do a lot of nasty things. Um, if it's an area that's prone to, like if you have a lot of electrical cords and you're kind of worried about a fire hazard, right? Don't put chemicals right next to that. <laughs> that could be a huge issue if that caused a fire. So just be aware of where you can and can't keep these from a storage spot um, and disposal, because some of them you can just toss in the trash, other ones you can't because it will affect things in the landfill because that's going to seep into the ground, right? So make sure you read that part. Don't worry about the EPM, uh, EPA registration number. It's just, that's just a legal jargon. You don't even know about that. Um, first aid is huge because if it is, like if you're dealing with something that's either in that yellow or that red, and you didn't read the first aid and that you accidentally spilled some on your arm and now your arm is burning, your first thing, what, what, is, what are you guys going to do? You're going to put water on it. Some chemical agents, if you add water, it will melt your skin off. Oh. Don't do that without reading the first aid because you could cause some serious damage that like medical professionals cannot fix okay? or without a lot of money they can't fix so make sure you know if it says do not put on water it might tell you to go straight to the er or use a solve or something else entirely um but make sure you read that read that before you even use the chemical <laughs> so that if something happens you're prepared on what to do in that moment instead of being in a lot of pain trying to read a tiny little thing on a label right the other one is just cautionary statements. So how can the product be used safely? Some of them are safe for vegetable use, but they're for insects. But it might be where you can't eat anything that you put this on for five days. So if you have eggplants and tomatoes that are three days away from being picked, and you put that on, and then you just go and pick them, and you eat that, even if you washed it, you're not getting the chemical off. It's still in that product of the plant. So you need to be aware of these things because you can really harm yourself, you can harm other people, or you can harm your pets and stuff. So don't be afraid to read the label. I know it's a lot of information, um, but if you just look at these main key parts, you can save yourself a lot of trouble. All right, so if you're really wanting to go with beneficials, here are some really cool ones that you can use. And in your packet, um, on that right-hand side, the other one you guys have is Mantis of Colorado. It tells you about the different mantis species, what their egg um, sacs look like, how you can encourage them in your habitats um, and keep them because they are a big predator species, not just for grasshoppers, but a lot of other insects that affect your guys' gardens and trees overall. So it's highly encouraged to keep them around. You can buy their eggs um, here locally. You can get them from foxes. You can get them from a lot of other places. And, you, and of course they're bugs, right? They're gonna do what they're gonna do. So you have to encourage them to stay in your yard. That's the hard part because you can spend $300 on praying mantis eggs and they all hatch out and you're like, cool, it sucks here. I'm going to your yard, <laughs> right? And you just, you watch your $300 walk across the road. Um, so making a habitat for them, encouraging them to stay is a big part of making sure you're getting your money's worth if you're gonna do this route, which is great. As you can see here, they're really bad at eating them, right? Um, they really like marigolds, roses, they like shady shrubbery plants, um, which of course kind of goes back, right, because that's where grasshoppers like to lay eggs, but the nice part is if you go and you see a lot of those egg sacs of cream mantis, they hatch about the same time the grasshoppers do, <laughs> and even the baby ones can eat because they're, the babies are bigger than the baby grasshoppers are, right, so even if you do that, just be aware that as long as you can encourage the eggs to be in that same area, they're gonna they're gonna fight it out. They're gonna duke it out, and you will have lower threshold numbers. So, so when is the best time to, to get them? So they usually don't start selling them until May, um, okay. because the frost or oh, last sure. little okay. bit of snow. They do like praying mantis naturally will lay them here. They lay them in the fall, and they encase them hard enough on their own that they'll withstand yeah. the temps. But yeah, places won't start selling them until oh, okay. May. Yeah. Um, and then dragonflies are another big one. Um, they really like grasshoppers, but of course. They're not gonna count if there's no water is the hard part. So, but even if you guys have like a little pond or even just like a little fountain, um, if you put in some aquatic plants and stuff like that, they like moving water, you can encourage them to stop by and just kind of hang out in your yard, which they'll definitely take some grasshoppers on their way. So doing things like that, which of course, if there's a nice flowing water source, you get the birds, right? So you have multiple things happening that are very beneficial. So that's something easy you guys can do. Wasps, I know everybody doesn't like wasps, <laughs> but, they are a big predator on grasshoppers, specifically yellow jackets and paper wasps. 
So what I encourage folks, like if you have a big enough area and it, it entirely depends on your setup, like, you know, if you have grandkids running around all the time and you can't deal with the walk, I understand. But if they're in a part of your yard that maybe you're not in a lot, it doesn't get a lot of disturbance, leave them alone because they're they're helping your yard. It may not seem like it, and of course you still run the risk of being stung, but they are helping with your grasshopper. Um, so specifically yellow jackets and paper wasps are our big wasp species here that will specifically target grasshoppers. Robber flies, um, those are those guys in that upper up picture. So what they do is very interesting. So when they're adults, they attack grasshoppers and other insects. She, that's a female and um, the, her tail end comes out, sticks in the grasshopper and it's like the movie Alien, if you've ever seen that, she injects eggs into it, the eggs hatch, the larvae eat the inside of the grasshopper and they pop out. Okay. So that's what robber flies do. <laughs> um, it's great. And they do this on a multitude of insects. It's not just um, it's not just grasshoppers. They do this on caterpillars and a lot of other different things. Um, it's pretty cool. They can, in fact, if I remember my numbers right, one female can affect between 15 and 30 insects um, in just one laying stage, which is huge. So even if you can get, you know, 15 to 20 of those gals, <laughs> that's huge. That's, that's a lot of grasshoppers that are going to knock down for you, right? Um, so definitely encouraging those guys as well. You can't buy those eggs here locally, but if you go to the Palisade Insectosory, it's called Request a Bug, you can get um, robber fly eggs. You can start hatching them out, which is cool. Um, blistered beetles are another one that will eat that nymph stage of grasshopper, that immature one. But if you guys, I know most of you are gardeners, so blister beetles often affect other things in your garden. Um, so it's a give and a take because they will eat the grasshoppers, but there's a chance that depending on what you're growing, what you have in your yard, they can affect your plants. Um, but the nice thing is if you have geese, geese love blister beetles. So what you could do, right, if you think about it, is if you do your visual count and you know that all you saw was nymphs, right? You didn't see a single mature adult grasshopper. You could go get some blister beetles let them loose you could make sure maybe you delay your planting or you put a net over it or you do different things to kind of limit the damage on your crop let them kind of infest the grasshopper population and then once you, you do another visual count maybe another two weeks or so those numbers are down right then i would just say hey i know you have five geese <laughs> can i borrow them <laughs> and you let them loose and they pick off the majority of the beetles because they love them they love them as a treat it's fantastic can you do that yeah Lots of people do do that. Yeah, I sometimes rent my chickens out because really? yeah, because I have neighbors who don't have them and they have insect issues, and so we just we do a barter system. And I'm like, all right, well, I see you growing grapes, so for and trade my chickens, I want some, of, and it just works out. So it's it's a great way. So if you know somebody has something, check out the conversation. I certainly will. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's worth asking. So yeah, so blister beetles are one of those where you're like, oh. and then of course we talked about birds and poultry are just other good ones to do. So now we've gone full circle. Yes, ma'am. Well, actually, I, I got a quick question. Um, yeah. Speaking of marigolds, because I know that those are kind of magical and which are a lot of pets. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of natural? Because I know it's not mint because I just plant the mint for the grasshoppers every year. Um, anything you can plant to kind of not real, not from like a smell sense or anything like that. They're not, they don't really care. Um, yeah. They will eat anything. And like people have tried like pepper stuff. You'll see a lot of stuff online that says use garlic and use these. Yeah. It's not very effective because the problem is, is it's, it, it triggers them as a bait. So if you put a lot of garlic stuff right on the edge of your garden, you are basically ringing the dinner bell and saying, here's where the food is. So if you're going to, there's different things online where like if you put like a, a tub out where they fall in after they smell that and they can't get out like in water or something, you're going to drown a lot of them. That is a great way to use that. Um, but that's the where people get confused is yes, it's helpful as a bait sense. It, it doesn't deter them, it brings them in. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, so I'd be very careful with that. Unfortunately, yeah, there isn't like a true plant that just keeps them away um, really. Um, I haven't, I know some of the species will eat marigolds and that's the hard part is because generally, because they're not territorial or anything, you're generally looking between three and five species in just your, your, your yard area. So you might affect one or two, but those other ones are just gonna go right on past and eat everything. So yeah, unfortunately. The only big thing is a lot of people do like um, sacrifice plants, if you will. So they'll make like a sacrifice area, which I'm sure as gardeners, you guys kind of know how to do that. But a lot of people do that for grasshoppers and they'll make it really tall and kind of 
weedy because when they're in that immature stage, they can't really get around easily because their legs are still forming. Like they're just, they're dangly. <laughs> they're, they're teenagers. So if you do that, then they kind of get wedged in there and then they typically don't leave even after they have their wings. Or when they do, they'll fully migrate like a full, they'll leave your yard at that point. So you can try things like that, um, but it's not a guarantee, unfortunately. But good questions. So fall management, because a lot of people say, okay, I know what to do now. I know what to look for during the spring and summer, but what do I do in the fall time? Because what do I do for next year, right? That egg count. Disturb the ground after the eggs have been laid. So if you know what species you've seen in your yard, like you know your top three are the two striped, your clear winged, and a differential, right? And you want to know, so all you do is Google, when do those lay eggs? And you're like, oh, they all lay in, October, um, in August. Great. So at the end of August, what you're going to do, you just use a little rake here, just to serve the ground. You don't have to go in there and just really like till everything and flip your whole yard upside down, just a little bit. Because the most they're going to do is lay in less than an inch of the soil. Like they don't get very deep because they can't. They don't have, even on our Mormon cricket, they can't get very deep in the soil. They don't have anything that allows them to dig. So it's very, very shallow. Um, just get, and you don't have to like collect the leaves or do anything like that. Just disturb it is the thing. Just move it around your yard. So I know a lot of you as gardeners, you know, you use it as mulch, you use it to hold water retention, things like that. That's great. Just shift it around. Don't let it stay in one spot is the big thing. And then the best thing to do, like, you know, we start getting cold here right around Halloween time. If you watch the weather and you know the first actual freeze, overnight freeze below 32 is coming, do this that day. Because what you're going to do is you're going to expose those egg capsules. That freeze is going to come. It's going to freeze them and they'll burst. You'll knock off that egg count. If you do this right a couple times during the fall, and because with us, we fluctuate so much during that, we get really hot and we get cold again, we go back and forth. If you time it right with the weather, you can knock your egg count down between 20 and 40%. That's massive. <laughs> That's huge when we look at that map. So doing simple things like this are huge, huge management steps. So it just takes a little bit of effort and time, but if you plan it right, you can save yourself all work. Does it would it work to do it now? It won't work so much now because they're already starting to hatch and we're not hitting cold enough temperatures at night. Um, you're just moving them around. Like yeah. you're not gonna hurt them. Yeah, that's that's the hard part. So yeah, um unfortunately, so since they already have started hatching, you guys have the, probably with this little bit of cover, we won't see much activity until it really starts warming up again. But if you all have looked at the weather forecast, it's gonna start hitting fifty by like Monday. So um, it's coming. <laughs> Would it be reasonable to remove that top layer of soil? You could, um, especially if your threshold was just like ridiculous and yeah. you knew that it was just really high. You absolutely could let that first freeze come in and then you can put it right back because they will burst and you will have disturbed it enough that now you've either buried them deeper where they can't because the nymphs can't crawl up and out of the soil. So if you flipped it completely and you smashed it down and you buried them deeper than an inch, they can't get out. So that wouldn't work now. Yeah, it wouldn't it work now. Yeah, it's, it's too late. Yeah, we're just in the hatching phase. Oh, it wouldn't work now because if you dig them deep, they're still going to be hatching and they can't get out, right? It, you're probably not going to get enough because it's then they've already started to move around in their eggs and stuff, uh -huh. but they're, they've started to get ready. So unfortunately, you're dealing with really strong ones versus in the winter, they're just, they're, they're nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, was there yeah. Oh, no, I can tater garden. And that's what I'm, I'm kind of wondering if, um, Something like that, boiling water just instead of the freezing. So um, a shorter. You could. Um, you could also like if you have a big enough bin, just flip, just dump out your containers if you can, depending on how big they are, uh -huh. and then just rotate the soil. So like what oh, was okay. on top, but on bottom, put the flop it, and just like really stir it real good, just mulch it up real nice, put it back. So that was there another one? So that's the biggest thing. Um, like again, if you have poultry or you can borrow somebody's poultry, specifically chickens are really good at this. Um, they do a really good job of disturbing stuff year round because that's just what they naturally do from a behavior standpoint. And that creates where there's enough air space and soil space between all the little particles of the grass that that will also help with that. And you can keep them out year round. So um, like I have chickens, like I said, I can tell you, I have done enough research in my yard. I don't have any egg counts where, where my chickens are. Um, because they're they're out there, and I have better grass growing because they have thatched it all for me. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, so I truly enjoy them. Um, of course, chickens also eat plants and stuff. So that's your management thing, right? Is that they will also and they if you let them in your garden, 
they will just scratch wherever they don't they don't think oh this is a tomato plant i'm not going to scratch it you know they'll just be like rip in and out it goes right so so just be aware of that if you do use chickens they don't have that kind of sense um so just you know use them with the like, common sense that chickens don't understand where they can and cannot dig and let you keep them so thanks for thinking about all righty any big questions or other things maybe we didn't touch on or you want to go back to or anything like that they will um and they like to eat them when they're small because a lot of the lizards we have here are the whiptail lizards um so they'll eat they like a lot of insects they'll eat small rodents and things like that they'll eat small birds if you can catch them sometimes um but yeah they definitely will so encouraging lizards and other reptiles in the yard is huge because frogs and toads are really good with that too we don't have as many of those here necessarily and they're they're kind of also on a cycle because of our weather um but if you have them and you can kind of encourage them to stick around well, I I heard that the, there's this product that you can buy mm -hmm. that you put it out in the I guess in the fall if it won't work in the springtime around where the grasshoppers underneath uh, logs or stuff does that really work? Um, do you remember what it was called? No, do you remember what it was called? Yeah. Yeah. It was a bait. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah so unfortunately, it. if you guys all hear about mobile bait, it does work. It's very effective. But the problem is, there was a fire at the factory a year ago. It completely destroyed the entire thing. They lost all their stores, and they have no idea when they will ever be able to sell again, if ever. So oh. it was very, very effective against them because it affected the adult stage because um, it was bait that they ate and it destroyed yeah. them from yeah. the inside out, and it could yeah. stop them from laying eggs if you did it right. Um. But that doesn't exist anymore in the oh. world. It's gone. Oh, no. So, was that yeah. the only place that 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 was literally the only? Place? Yeah, and it, I guess because the way that they had it for the patent and stuff for the bait was part of the problem. And then the other problem is looking into it. There was a way they had to age it, and they kept all the aged stuff in that one factory. Oh. <laughs> so when it caught on fire, they lost everything instead of wow. diversifying. You know, and like just I mean, they could have put like just a smidge of that somewhere else so that's the yeah. other part is they can't eat like there is no way to speed that up and, and age it they just it. so that's the problem yeah. yeah yeah so i was almost losing a couple of trees to grasshoppers mm -hmm. and i literally ended up netting my tree was there is there any other way to to prevent your tree from were they decimated i'm assuming they were adults that you were probably seeing right i'm sure i was yeah okay. i was adults yeah. So with adults like that, I'm sure you specifically, you can look at using what is neem oil. It is more effective on them. Um, or if you can catch them in that last like stage four or five where like they're bigger, they have wings, but they're like, they're still just kind of crawling, they're not really flying. Um, that is pretty effective with them. But the problem is with neem oil, if you guys know, um, it's bad for, for bees. But yeah, if you're using it on trees, like on if you have a cottonwood, you have an elm, you have a maple, whatever, um, the bees aren't necessarily, they don't, they're not, they don't go for yeah. the bark. They go for things yeah. that they can pollinate. So if you do it right, or if you do it towards like dusk or dawn, when the bees are either, they're either going back to the hive where they haven't come out yet, or maybe it's a cooler day where they're not flying as much or cloudy, um, you can definitely use neem oil and you can just spray it. Cause you can spray that directly on them. Mm -hmm. um, and you can spray it on the bark and you're not going to affect bees. Cause neem oil is, is very toxic to bees. How do you spell that? It's N-E-E-M. And that is sold over the counter. You'll see it in like Lowe's Home Depot. It just says neem oil oh, okay. or neem spray. Mm -hmm. um, and you can use that. Just again, really make sure you read that label yeah. because it will tell you when you can and can't use it. Because that is also temperature um, specific mm -hmm. with that one. Okay. So you just you have to like balance. And if you if you don't see any bees in your yard normally, then you probably don't have to worry about it as much. But it can also affect things like wasps. It can affect things like um, hummingbirds and stink wow. moths and yeah. stuff like that. So. Um, just be aware of that, that it can affect some of those other things. What's your opinion on, on eco brand? It works, but again, not a good thing. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I mean, if you're if you're having that level of damage, then it's something to look into. But mm -hmm. yeah, if it's if you're not quite there, you can do other things. Okay. Um, I, I would if you if possible. What's that yeah. bad? That she has to eco brand it. um it's just it affects more than just pollinators it kind of it's like it's a sport sure thing it will mm -hmm. kill like your dung beetles that are huge for our soils mm -hmm. ants i mean it just mm -hmm. it, it wipes out yeah it's it's pretty destructive mm -hmm. so, you know, and we need a lot of those guys so yeah. Mm -hmm. i've even heard some cases of it affecting like different species of spiders um mm -hmm. 
which as you guys know, like spiders are huge and keeping insects down. So I'm like, oh, I don't like spiders in my house, but I want them outside. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. How do you rectify when moving around the soil with bees and other beneficial insects that are overwintering in, in your yeah? So um, and so if, if you guys don't know, so native bees that we have, they do burrow um, in the ground, or they do, or they'll just like kind of nest in those same areas. You can try to wait. Um, is the thing, and you can also do it like you can do it earlier. Um, so they'll they won't really nest until October. Um, so if you if you disturb it like August September, you're gonna get a lot of the main grasshopper species, and that way you can do that kind of let it settle, and then if you know it warms up again in December like it has before here, um, but you're worried about the native bees, I would say you can still do it. Just be careful. Maybe don't use a rake. Use like your hand and just kind of flip that stuff upside down, um, kind of just spread it out differently because you'll see, you'll, I mean, those eggs, we'll go back to the egg slide, you'll really be able to, because they're clusters um, mm -hmm. is the big thing for um, grasshoppers. So if you see clusters like that, you can even just pluck that out yourself and then you can leave it if you think that there's a lot of disturbance. So native bees will also, you'll see like little holes in the ground too. Mm -hmm. So if you like move your leaf pile and you see a lot of that, you can assume that there's probably native bees in that area if not in the soil so maybe you don't want to use a rake right there but you could use like your hands kind of disturb some of that stuff you can look for the egg deposits because you can you can see them there right next to the dime um you just got to kind of get in there and look at it um but and do that so if you do it gently i would say would be the best way um or you can just encourage other beneficials um native bees will eat some of them but not a not a lot not a lot of those native bees just they're just pollinators they just a lot of pollinate, they really don't need other insects in this part. Other questions? What about aerosols? That one is one you can use. I don't know um, offhand what all it affects. I would just encourage you to read the label really. Um, and, and be aware of what's in your yard. Because um, if you have like a lot of hummingbirds that come or a lot of praying mantis, or you have a high concentration of dung beetles, which if you guys don't know, dung beetles also will are predatory insects. Um, so not only do they help with manure spreading in your yard of, of all those things, but they eat a lot of other insects too, which is um, huge for garden management. So um, just be aware of what it says it can affect. Look, look for that active ingredient and then um, Google, Google what that kills specifically. Yeah. Other questions? So don't step on beetles, in other words. Yeah, <laughs> they do have a purpose. Um, you didn't talk about manual destruction, because that was my my, yes. so, my thing last year. Yeah, I went out and killed a hundred grasshoppers every morning. Yes, <laughs> you absolutely can do that. I mean, if it is to the point where, like, when we were collecting these big ones, I mean, you're just they're just like everywhere. Like, you don't even have to, you don't have to search for them because there's so many. You can absolutely just like shovel and dump. Um, and they drown, so you can like dump them into like a pool, um, especially Colors. if you, yeah, you can like Colors. clip them. Um, My you know, dogs ate them. Dogs ate a couple pounds. I believe they're, they're very high in protein. They're, 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 they're a dare snack. They wouldn't come inside because they were just intent on getting those grass. I believe it. So, yeah, I mean, you, you can let your dogs free. I mean, you can, you can like just shovel them if there's enough. I mean, you can just grab them with your hand and throw them into a thing of water where they, you know, as long as the sides are slick and they can't like perch on something. Because if you guys look, um, they do have like little spikes on all their legs yeah. this allows them to grip on this so you want something that's really smooth um that has water in it that they can't use those because they will act like if there's any little edge they will be able to survive so um you just really want it super smooth um you can do things like where it adds you know a little bit kind of like how we do with miller moths and you know you guys make those little traps you can do something similar for grasshoppers um and especially if you like do it you make it at night and then you like put a light on it so that in the dawn, you know, it's like really pretty and it looks really nice. And then you could put some of that garlic oil around it and it's a bait. They're going to go in that fall in ground. So you can absolutely manually do that. Um, if your threshold is just, there's just so many and you got to do something until you can figure out another way to deal with them. Cold wet mornings are a really good time to go and get furnace. Yes, because it slows them down. So, yeah, definitely that dew. Like, if it's a dewy morning, you're like, today's the day. <laughs> you can go out there and just, and I mean, you know, you can do that. So, and they'll be, because they'll be moving around. You'll see them, and you can just 
yeah. just go through because a lot of people do that with like beetles they'll do that with like some of the japanese beetles and stuff you know um i heard people doing it with vacuums like a shot back um, oh yeah and you oh, yeah. Just suck them all up and you can do that too so with those you just get a bowl with water and soap mm -hmm. and you put it under they drop yeah when wow. disturbed they drop straight down put it where just put the bowl put a bowl of water with soap under the Japanese beetles. Oh, and then oh. when they get disturbed, they drop straight down. Oh. So they'll drop right into it for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned netting. Is that effective at all when just over vegetables? It will be. Um, it depends on your threshold of So it can keep them out of it, but depending on your plant that you're netting, it can affect them so much. Yeah, and then the you're affecting where bees can't get in, other things can't get in. So yeah. it's it's a it works, but at what Cost, yeah. right? Because and then you're also putting that added weight. Like if you're putting it directly in your plants, it's yeah. added weight on top of your plants, so they're not going to grow up. Like your tomato plants, other things that are sensitive to weight, it, they're not going to produce very well. Mm, so you can, yeah. yeah. And like in early stages, like if you have seedlings that you just transplanted, like in May, you know, like after the shed cell, and you guys get uh, new seedlings and you put them in, you can make a little tent with that netting, and absolutely while you figure out how what your grasshopper level is, because that's fine. Like the seedlings are going to do what they're going to do and they're not big enough to worry right. about. Um, and that way you can figure out what are my management goals for the so year. The netting would have to be pretty far. It is. Yeah, I can. Um, I have a different presentation. I'll show you guys what the netting looks like because um, I do have a picture of that. This is this is a different grasshopper uh, presentation, <laughs> but it <laughs> but it does have a, a netting picture in it. Um, it was a locust. Uh, image the there it is go back so that's the netting um that is um yeah it's like a cheese cloth it's really fine um so but you have to at least with these big guys their teeth are massive so i can tell you when we caught these i had gloves on and we just picked them up they bit through leather gloves I had on. Oh my gosh. Their teeth are serious. It, I screamed. I will absolutely yeah. admit because I was not prepared for that. Um, and he put a hole in my glove and I like oh. threw him because I was like, no, <laughs> no. Um, so the big ones have serious teeth where they can get through that. They can absolutely like eat through that. So if you're dealing with the plain leather ones specifically, I, I mean, you're, you will slow them down. But I mean, you're not going to slow them down for long. Because remember, they're, they hit adult stage in five to six weeks. That's, that is nothing in plant time. That's, that's nothing. So, you know, so if you have some of these other species, um, here. So if you have some of these, um, the black ones, they don't get as big and they hatch later and stuff. So you could absolutely net stuff. And th this is as big as they get. So you're not going to have that same teeth issue like you would with the big one. So you can absolutely do it more with these guys okay. and just have a better um, damage reduction. Mm -hmm. So I noticed some that were like so big, and then when I get to them, they didn't move. Why did Why do they get so oversized like they don't even move? Um, a lot of it's because they can't. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. I was like, um, is it just disabled because they're so huge? Yeah, um, it is. Yeah, it's like um, these plants, just... like these are small ones. <laughs> they were definitely not the biggest ones. Like, right, right. Um, and yeah, it's just it because that that exoskeleton is hardened so much that unless they have that mutation where they can turn to the locust, they just they don't have the muscles. So yeah, they're like going to flick them and they they're just they're, like, they get so big and they harden so much that they're just like these walk they're yeah. like knights of armor where they're just kind of the oh, two man yeah, okay. and they're stuck and they can just it's slowly so destroy strong. everything. They'll find <laughs> those, they will. Okay. I mean, they they're like slugs. They will absolutely yeah. they will get there. It may take them from <laughs> but they will cause destruction. All right. So what is yeah. the typical lifestyle? I mean, lifespan of the of the grass. It's just a year, so they hatch in that springtime. The adults will always die in the fall. Like even if even if we got like a smidgen of snow here, the minute that snow falls, it kills the adults. They don't they don't overwinter. They don't grow. They don't do anything like that. So they will die. They're, yeah. So it's really just three to four months of infestation for here specifically. If you move mm -hmm. to other areas of color, like on the eastern plains where it's a little mm -hmm. longer um you know it's, it's different if you're on the slopes at all it's different because of elevation so just thinks me out is anybody here from uh rye or Gila? 
No? We're we have a facility in Beulah, yeah. Okay. I hear it was even bad when it you was guys. Worse. That's yeah. when I was seeing the ones that wouldn't even move, and that was all the time. Yeah, and which was impressive because they're so big at higher elevation. I mean, that's that's impressive for for an insect because yes. most things don't like elevation. Yeah. Things generally have less as we go higher. Yeah, not the not the same for pterodactyls. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you, um, the Mormon crickets. I want those guys. I'm gonna show you guys the other ones. Um, the Mormon crickets. Okay. Um. They're, they don't turn into locusts necessarily, but they are a swarming type. So these were only in Moffat County, which is in the, the northwest corner of our state. Um, they get in the millions altogether. Oh, wow. yeah. There were so many that um, they clogged up a highway up there. And you want to know how they got rid of them? Um, they let semi trucks drive two at a time <laughs> and they plow through them <laughs> because they don't stop moving. They're, they have a horde type of mind, um, and they will just keep swallowing the horde. So they just kept coming across, and the semis would go back, and then they back up and reverse as fast as they could, and just keep back and forth, back and forth. There's a video somewhere on YouTube of it um, of last year, because wow. there was just so many. Um, and that's how they got rid of these. So thankfully, that's really the only spot in the state that we have these guys. Um, it seems to be a weird thing with elevation, where they don't, they can't go as far like it's just I don't exactly know why they can't but they just they don't so thankfully you shouldn't see any here but if you do call me because <laughs> I want to know <laughs> um because that's cool so yeah and definitely you know you guys can always call and we can help you ID them we can help you with management stuff or if you're like you know I don't I can't tell what stage I have I just know it's a problem can you come out we can come out we can do a site uh, visit that's free we'll come out we'll help you count Make sure your numbers are right, and then we can say, oh, yep, you're at like fourth stage. Here's what you need to do. Oh, you know, you're at adult stage now, so we got to figure something else out because there's no point in going and buying seven or whatever um, and kind of helping you through that. So just remember you have some extra resources if, you're, if you feel overwhelmed. But I definitely encourage you to get out there now, especially this coming week. Tuesday is the first day of spring. Um, we're warming up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's here. It's, it's time. So I definitely tell you get out there, check your yards. But there's nothing we can really do. If you're seeing nymphs, some of the baits and sprays, um, okay. the other handout, let's see, this one. yes, this other one that you guys have, the yeah. one that's a Utah pet, it has a nice list of treatment options, um, an example one. Oh. I would encourage you, if you start seeing them, if oh, you're out there in your yard, check this out, okay. have this in your pocket, and then go to Lowe's, one of these little boxes, wherever you go. Um, and because a lot of the nymphs can be affected by like in, uh, baits and things like that. And the baits aren't so bad because you can put it where they congregate. Because remember, the nymphs, they don't go very far from where they are surrounded because they can't. They're, they're still growing. They can't fly. Like their legs are still wonky. So baits are a really good way when they're young. So um, I would encourage you to really go look at that. Obviously, some of the species they talk about here are in Utah. Um, but it, the principle still applies. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you all so much. Um, appreciate it. And have a good day. That's so, a good presentation. Yeah. yeah. So that door is unlocked, so you don't have to worry about getting out. Just getting in. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then if anyone needs a restroom before you leave, they are on lock. Um, and you can get in and out of there. And then we'll have some questions and answers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank that's the female one. Right? Yeah. Um, the the the, oh, the, 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 the bottom one's the female. Right? Yeah. That's interesting. I, had I, had I know. I think it's a beautiful bird. Yeah, it is. It's on one of my trees. That is very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just I just think three of them like five days. Um, There's no the west side. Uh, it only lasts for a couple of months. Actually, it's just four. Uh, it's just four. Sure. I'm not 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 s
We will be in touch. Let me know. Okay. Okay. I got it. All right. Great. so I did that and when it rained and the sun came out and I had a bread garden. Yeah, that was like not a good idea. Yeah, flowers can help a little bit, but that's exactly it. It's turned into bread. Yeah, yeah, and then you almost bread. Or, you know, you know, so I eat that. Yeah, it was oh. just a huge mess. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thanks so much good. for doing the door. Sure. Appreciate it. Thanks, Beth. Yeah. Uh, see you in a couple weeks. Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. It's all coming up. Well, that was just funny. I hope I, could, I was hoping I'd disturb the soil <laughs> still yet. Yeah. Really not. Unfortunately, well, it's a. Uh, thank you so much. You? Yeah, thank you guys. Good to see you.